Good morning. Please turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 21. That's 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 21. In the Pew Bibles, it's page 1401, 1401. Again, 1 John 4, 12 through 21. It reads, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe that the God, that the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. It's a beautiful day, and we are so thankful for the presence of each one here today. We are honored if you are visiting with us. We hope that you'll come back and worship with us again and again. Keep your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at the second part of this chapter, the disposition of the family uh, of God. Chapter 3, we talked about the dynamics. John's overarching theme in 1 John is fellowship. The relationship that we enjoy with our Heavenly Father. A lot of it has been said recently in the news about imports and exports. A Sunday school teacher was trying to instill the dependence upon God to her students. And so what she asked them is she said, Now, think about something in your house that God made. One little boy shot up his hand. He said, Teacher, he said, I can't think of anything in my house that God made. Everything in our home was made in China. Sometimes it takes a little adjustment in our perspective to see God for all that God is and all that He means in our lives. In 1952, in Popular Science magazine, there was an ad that the Hayden Planetarium put into the magazine. It was an offer for an interplanetary trip to go and see the moon Venus, Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn. Now, obviously, in 1952, interplanetary travel was not possible. But within days, they received 18,000 applications. Since the trip was just a publicity stunt, it wasn't really an offer, they had all these applications and they said, well, what do we do with them? They turned them over to a group of psychologists who began analyzing those applications. And what the psychologists found was that the majority of those applicants had made the application because they wanted a better life. They were not satisfied with the life that they currently had, so therefore they thought going somewhere else might be a better life. Do you enjoy your life? Are you happy with the fact that you have a relationship with God and the life that you're living right now is being lived in that relationship with Almighty God? Do you recognize your Heavenly Father as being imminent or present in your life at all times? Do you see that? That interplanetary travel, by the way, Elon Musk and his SpaceX project is planning in 2032 to have 24 colonists go to the planet Mars. So if you're still looking, you can apply for that, all right? 
understand we should be able to find what brings about the genuine joy of relationship right here, right now. In 1 John chapter 4, in the letter of 1 John, in 105 or 106 verses, he uses love 45 times. But in this chapter, in 21 verses, he uses love 27 times. Almost 60% of John's usage of this term love is used right here in this chapter. The disposition of God's family, that we protect the identity of Jesus. We talked about that last week, that Jesus has come in the flesh. We connect with one another. We love one another. This morning, what I want us to look at from verse 12 to 21 is that we project the love of God by our lives and by our relationships with one another. We project. God is love. Love, therefore, becomes a quality that helps us to understand God. No, love does not define God, but God defines love. There are many people who have very mistaken ideas about love. In fact, a lot of people think that love is related to some sort of a physical relationship, and it even results in them practicing immorality. That's not love. That's not the kind of love that God wants us to project or or to live out in our lives. He wants us to understand that love is seeking what genuinely is best for another person. And who can tell us what's best apart from God? God is the one who tells us why we're here, what we're doing, and where we're going. It is God who gives us the genuine definition of love. Somewhere recently, it was less than two months ago, I think I heard a a message that love is powerful. Uh, It was at the royal wedding for Harry and and Meghan Markle on May 19th. The Episcopal bishop preached about love is powerful. And the way he talked about it, I, I got the feeling that love can climb mountains and cross oceans and inspire greatness, and love can keep us going when the going gets tough. Yes, love is powerful. But love is also powerful because it gives us a reason. It gives us a reason for living. It gives us an understanding of life. It gives us a future that is far greater. So look with me at 1 John chapter 4. In verses 12 to 16, this projects the love, that is the perfect love, in our best life now. Love lets us live the very best life that we can live. God is, as John says in verse 8, love. Again, but love doesn't define God. God defines love. So think about it. Love is something special. A navigator, when they are trying to find direction, they use a compass. Now, the navigator doesn't look at the compass and say, Compass, please point north. The compass has a natural bent. It it is designed to point north. That's because of the magnetic field of the earth and the magnetic poles of the earth, draw that compass to north. All right? It defines the direction, and therefore the navigator knows where he's going. Love, in that same sense, helps us to navigate life, helps us to define what is best for us. Notice what John says, no one has seen God at any time. There are several Phrases used in the Bible, John 4, 24, John writes that Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Earlier in 1 John, in chapter 1 and verse 5, John said, God is light. Now again, we don't think of God as being all the light. I mean, God's not in the uh, incandescent bulbs that we have here in the auditorium but yet God is that true light that allows us to see right from wrong, truth from a lie. He is the defining principle of the difference between light and darkness. So God is light, just as God is love. If you want to know what love is, look at what God, what God did 
In verses 9 to 11, John has just described that Jesus was manifested. That word manifested means to bring out in the open or into the public. Jesus died on the cross and it wasn't hidden. It was seen. It was recognizable. And why did he do that? So that you and I, two reasons that John gives, so that you and I might live through him and that our sins might be paid, satisfied, propitiated by the death that Jesus gave his life, his body, his blood. Jesus did that. Why? Because of love. It was manifested. Jesus could have said, well, I'll die on the cross, but I want it private. I don't want anybody to see my humiliation. No, it was out in the open. There was a multitude, there was a crowd, and they witnessed it. They saw him die as he hung on the cross. And Jesus did that. He displayed what love is so that we would have no mistaking that love is not selfish. Love does not seek its own. Love is not about its own pride or, or, or trying to elevate itself. Love is absolutely sacrificial. Love is willing to take self out of the picture and do what is best for others because it's needed. Love. And so John talks about this love as it is projected. What God did, God did not leave us in the dark. He communicated what this love is. He wanted us to understand it so that when we see it, we could recognize it. Everything that God has done is to help us to see that. And so he talks here in verses 12 to 16 what God is doing and how God is working. There are several passages in the New Testament. In Ephesians 2.10, after talking about the grace of God, God, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When we think about Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. For to me to live is Christ, Philippians 1.21, and to die is gain. These things define what our life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be lived to the glory of God. And so what Paul would say, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do all, Colossians 3, 23, to the glory of God. He is the Lord of glory. When we look at Jesus, we see love. We see it epitomized. We see it demonstrated. We see it displayed. Your life is meant to project or display that same love. Look at your life. How are you living it? Are you living it with that kind of love? What is God doing in you? What is God doing for others in demonstrating love in your life? A few years ago, there was a college class, and they were, it was a drama class, and they were going to put on a, a production, a play. But they didn't have a lot of money, so the director, the, the professor, cut a few corners, and he just bought a few copies of the script. He thought he could just cut it up and give each person their part and the play would be just fine. So he distributed the various parts and they got together for their rehearsal and the director was so frustrated. Nobody recognized their cue. They completely mangled some of the consequences or, or some of the sequences. And he said, wait a minute. He said, do you all even understand what this play is all about? They kind of looked at each other and said, no. He said, sit down. And he read the entire play to them. When they heard the whole drama, they looked at each other and they said, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You see, no one has seen God, but they've seen you. And there are people living lost in the world who want to see God. And they're looking around and they're looking at Christians. They're looking at the people of God and, and they're saying, what are they displaying? How are they demonstrating the love of God? Can people see in the message of your life how you're living the love of God? Or is it somehow hidden? Remember what Jesus said? He goes, you're the light of the world. And he talked about a city that's set on a, head, a hill cannot be hidden. And then he said, nor do people light a lamp and then put a, a basket or bushel over it. No, they, they light that lamp and they put it where it can be seen, where it can give light to all who are in the room. See, God has put His church on display 
so that the world can see love. People are watching. They're watching you. And they're asking, what are you displaying? When John talks about this fellowship, it's the same thing that we read in the book of Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, God had fellowship with His creation. And He walked and talked in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve enjoyed that fellowship with God. But then sin, by their own choice, they separated themselves from God. The punishment was that they could not have that same intimate closeness with God, and they were separated. You know what one of the key phrases that's used in the rest of the book of Genesis? Walking with God. Enoch walked with God in Genesis 5. In Genesis 6, it says Noah walked with God. That's why he got to build the ark. Abraham, the father of the faithful, a friend of God, walked with God. Walking with God. When we get over to the book of Exodus, the people are to be walking with God. And what God says there in Exodus 25 and verse 8, He says, I want them or I'm going to let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exodus 25, 8. That I may dwell among them. God wants that relationship. He wants us to have that renewed, restored relationship. And that's what the Bible is all about. Sin separates but the blood of Jesus reconciles. The love of God didn't leave us outside. It ushers us back in through the blood of Jesus. That's what God projected in Christ. And so that word abide six times in verses 12 to 16, it means to dwell, to live. Is God dwelling in you? Are you abiding in Him? Our relationship with Him is lived out in how we relate to one another. Secondly, this projection of perfect love helps us to be able to deal with the future. In verses 17 and 18, what John says is that we're going to have to face God one day in the day of judgment. But recognize this love causes us not to have this fear. To say, well, what am I going to say to God? You see, the love of God through the blood of Jesus gives us boldness to say, I know what I'm going to say. My elder brother took my place. My Savior died in my place. Jesus, the righteous one, is my advocate. He stands here. He pleads my cause. He answers the cry. What do I need? I need righteousness. What does Jesus provide? Righteousness. That I can be clothed in the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That I can have what God wants me to have and that's what God gives us. He says perfect love casts out fear. He's not talking about, by the way, the fear of of drowning or the fear of snakes or the fear uh, of spiders. Okay? All right. I was looking to see if anybody cringed when I mentioned that. Whatever phobias you have, and that's the word here for fear is the word phobia, understand whatever phobias you have, that's not just what he's talking about. He's talking about the the fear, that paralyzing thought, that when I stand before God, I got nothing to say. Living my life with no message, that I don't have a theme, that there's not something about me, that when you break it down, when you come to the very core, the heart and center of who I am, Who am I? What Jesus answers, he gives that perfect love casts out fear. Satan is an accuser. The Bible talks about him accusing the brethren in Revelation 12, 9 and 10. He stands before God saying, look at them. They let you down again. Over and over. How many times does that make it? Where he did that or she thought this or they said that. How many times, God? God says, my children have been washed in the blood. My children are walking in the light. They have fellowship with the Son, and that blood cleanses them. It goes on washing them, keeping them righteous. Satan wants to harm you. He wants to hurt you. He wants to hinder you. He wants to handicap you. 
What the Hebrew writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What Satan wants to do is anchor you to your sin. He wants it to make an indelible impression where you say, I can't forget it. I can't let go of my sin. I can't trust that God loves me enough to forgive me. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus hanging on the cross? How great is God's love? How much does God want to forgive you? He sent His Son, the love of God takes away that fear. And we can have the confidence to say, I want to live. Satan constantly tells us that the things that happen to us in life are bad. Bad. They're, they're uncomfortable. They're inconvenient. They seem horrible at the time. I bet every one of you has gone through some set of circumstances you would say, never again. Don't ever want to do that again. Don't ever want to experience that again. That was once, don't ever want to do that again. Satan wants to tell us whatever it is that you're dealing with in life, that that's the worst. It doesn't matter if you've got a hurting relationship or if you've lost a job or you've lost a loved one or you're dealing with the aging process, <clears throat> all of us. That aging process, by the way, Do you know why God gave us bodies that wear out? You say, I don't know, but that's a cruel joke. No. What God wants you to understand is what the message is. He wants you to understand the purpose. He wants you for Himself. He wants you in a relationship. And every time you have an ache, every time that something in your, in your physical realm doesn't work the way you want, what you need to remind yourself is, I am one day closer, one day nearer to my God. If we just got stronger and better all through life, we wouldn't be looking forward to what comes next. But you know what? When my joints ache, when my body, when I look in the mirror and I see there's not as much hair as there used to be, all right? When I think about all the things that are happening and when, I, when I'm having to help other people who are struggling as they age, as their physical abilities diminish, you know what I'm reminded? God's got something better. I am one day closer to my God. It's not a bad thing. Satan wants you to say, oh, this is unbearable. It's unimaginable. How could God be good and let this much or this many problems exist? Oh, those problems. That's not what God purposed when He created us. What He purposed is for us to dwell with Him forever. So in verses 19 to 21, John closes and he says, this projects love into all of our relationships. If a man says, when he says that in verse 20, we love him because he first loved us. But if somebody says, what John says is this is a test. Can you pray that test? Can you pray, God, test my love for you. Prove that I love you above all things. Try me so that I can know and you know that I love you. I lift you up. I exalt you in my life. See, the love of God ought to be clear. It is so far greater than anything else we experience and even any physical relationship that we share. The love of God is so superior. It ought to give us the confidence to say, I know where I'm going and I know who I'm looking forward to see there. Sometimes we talk about being reunited with loved ones and yes, that'll be a wonderful thing. The reunion, the homecoming aspect of heaven. But I'm going to tell you to see God, to be in His presence is greater than anything that we have ever imagined. Do you remember what Philip said to Jesus? Show us the Father and it will suffice us. There in John 14, 8 and 9, Philip had a, a pretty grand quest, a, a, a great desire. Show us the Father. What does John say here in verse 12 and 20? No one has seen God at any time. 
but we've seen Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. He is the very essence of God with us. God in the flesh. He is the love of God manifested so that we can see what love looks like. If people in the world see you and they see you loving other people, that is seeking what is genuinely best for others, they're seeing the love of God. No one has seen God, but the world is dying to see the Father. Friedrich Nansen was an Arctic, a Norwegian Arctic explorer. He took his ship up into the Arctic Ocean and he kept a log book of, of different things. And one of the things was as they were sailing that icy ocean, they put out soundings to test, test the deep, uh, the depth of the water. And so they would put out a line and then Friedrich Nansen would write deeper than that. He put out a longer line and he wrote in his log book deeper than that. At many spots, and in fact, the last notation in Friedrich Nansen's logbook was deeper than that. You want to know about the love of God? It's deeper than that. It's something, a subject that we cannot fully comprehend. It's deeper than that. A.W. Tozer said this, I can no more do justice to this awesome and wonder-filled topic than a child can grasp a star. Still, by reaching toward the star, the child may call attention to it and even indicate the direction one must look to see it. And so I stretch my heart toward the high, shining love of God so that we may be encouraged to look up and have hope. This morning, are you looking up? Are you enjoying life? Do you have hope? Do you recognize how the perfect love of God casts out fear and projects to the world the saving power and the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then that's where you need to start. To put your confidence and your faith in Christ and to be baptized this morning so that you can have the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you've done that, but you realize that the love of God has not been projected in your life and that people have not known that that is the central message, that's the essence of who you are. Renew your commitment to let others see the love of God in you. May God help us to be the light of the world, to reflect the light and the love of Jesus. If you need to come, just step down to the front right now while we stand and while we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling.